microphone. Okay, we're live. We are live. I hope so. And we are yeah. alive. <laughs> so <laughs> we just have some la last minute uh, troubles uh, getting into this uh, Google Hangout, but now everything should be set. My name is Johannes, and uh, I'm going to lead this uh, the next hour where we're going to talk about uh, the three essential dimensions of integral love relationships. And we have uh, the honor to talk to Martin Uchik uh, today, and uh, we have Panilla and Stein as well. Uh, maybe everybody could just give uh, a, a brief introduction of themselves. I'll just start uh, with myself. I met Martin Uchik about three years ago, where I invited him to Denmark, and since then we've been doing uh, about four or five workshops in Denmark, and uh, doing that uh, since 2012, I guess, yeah. So it's about three years. And uh, I came in touch with Martin through his book, uh, Integral Relationships, which has now been published in Danish, and the uh, second edition is on its way now. Um, and uh, I was really moved by this vision of, of integral relationships, but I don't think I will talk more about that now. Martin will go more into depth with integral relationships and the vision that comes with this way of viewing relationships. So maybe I'll just shift over to Steen and Panilla, and you can just uh, say a little bit about yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm Panilla. I met Martin uh, February this year at a workshop uh, you held, Martin, in the Silica Ball uh, about uh, integral uh, relationships. And um, my first thought after the workshop was finished was how could we ever work with you again? How, how could we? Um, make it happen that other people from Denmark, especially, could uh, participate and share um, what you have to give. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that it's going to happen in a while. <laughs> so I'm looking so much forward to to uh, to your training and yeah, um, hmm, yeah, that's all for now. Yeah, Martin has uh, is going to lead this one-year training, but I think we will come back and talk more about that in the end as well. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and Steen. Yeah, my name is Steen, um, and Penilla and I are living together, and we both uh, uh, participated in Martin's workshop in February, January uh, this year, and. We're very delighted to uh, to meet Martin and and uh, uh, participate in the workshop and learn about relationships and how the we space can expand. And I think Martin will talk a lot more lot more about that later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And uh, welcome to you, Martin, as well. Um, Maybe you can also say a few words to people who are new to your work about who you are. Yeah, <laughs> who am I? It's always a very big question, right? Who am I? But uh, how I came to doing this work is that, uh, as most of you know, I, I grew up in Germany and uh, we mo I moved to the U.S. with my wife and our three children in '95. And after I met Eckhart Tolle and, and trained a little bit with him as a group facilitator. Um, my wife and I, we very amicably separated because I wanted to have a more spiritual, deeper, uh, emotional connection with a woman and a relationship. And um, I was really dumbfounded when I started to date American women how different the expectations were, uh, which probably also had to do with, with the age, you know, that I was much older and uh, that I dated women you know, who were probably in their 40s, 50s and uh, struggled with relationships and uh, uh, like for four or five years I, I tried to find a new, a new wife basically. I wanted to get married again and it eluded me and then I discovered Ken Wilber's integral philosophy and one day it hit me that if I would apply his integral map uh, to my relationship experiences 
uh, everything started to make sense. And uh, I was really surprised when I found out that there wasn't a book that already used uh, integral philosophy uh, to look at relationships. And since I wanted to have that book, I wrote it. Uh, Basically, for myself, I didn't even have much of an agenda that it would uh, sell around the world, which it does now. And uh, and then when the book was published in 2010, a year later, I started to design a workshop that I have now facilitated in, in Europe and US and in Australia. And then this idea in last March came up. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite a bit of travel for me to, to go to all of these different countries. And I'm working on a new book that actually in, in, in Norway and then in Denmark this idea came up if I couldn't train you know some some people to facilitate the workshops and use the integral model in their, their coaching and their work as uh, therapists and relationship professionals. So mm -hmm. that's why we're here today basically to talk about the three essential elements you know that uh, make up an integral evolutionary love relationship. Yeah, thank you. And uh, before we, we go further into the three dimensions of integral relationships, I just want to point out that it's possible to send in questions during the call. If you have any questions that you want Martin to uh, answer, you can uh, do so here on Google+. Plus. If you are on Google+, Google Plus, you can just submit the questions directly, or you can also send an email to mail at heartaction.dk. That's my mail address and uh, I will check my email during the call to see if any question pops in. Um, but I guess uh, that's just a reminder. Uh, but um, I guess we should just get started with these three dimensions. And uh, mm -hmm. Martin, the first dimension is called uh, to love unconditionally. Yes. Um, so, would you say a, f a few more words about this dimension? Yes, sure. Uh, so, when we read about mystics and, and we also look at, at Ken Wilber's model, um, I think there is a, like a sense of, of people who have had mystical experience and, and, and have meditated uh, often a long time, that there seems to be so like a, a ground of all being. That, that connects us all in, in basically in, in, in an unim, unmanifest uh, world. And sometimes people have this notion that you know I, they love a person or an animal or maybe even a group of people unconditionally, but uh, then after a while that seems to fall uh, apart. And so the, the, the idea of unconditional love is really that, that we love everything that arises in, in our consciousness unconditionally. So even mm. maybe problems that arise or physical things. So if we cannot surrender and be connected and stay present with everything that arises, how ugly it may be or how difficult it may be or what kind of form it takes, then we can also not really love uh, an individual unconditional. So when I when I talk about unconditional love, that's really meaning loving everything that arises, uh, universal mm -hmm. unconditional love versus localized love, where we would say I love my partner, I love my child, I love my cat unconditionally, but I hate my neighbor and I <laughs> hate my freaking car that's always breaking down and I whatever I don't like my nose, right? So. So unconditional love really includes everything that is arising. And mm. then of course that also then includes if we are in a love relationship with an individual, then that includes that person no matter what that person does uh, and how this person behaves. So you could say it's it's much easier to go to a mountain and love everything unconditionally and then the, the, the descent into the valley of human life is a little bit more difficult journey. Right. You, you right. also phrased it one place in your book where you say that uh, love is unconditional but relationships are not so so uh, venturing into this 
also conditioned uh, landscape of relationship is also a part of it. Many books uh, focus on this unconditional aspect, but you also take in the, the, the more conditional aspect, right? Right, yeah. So Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now, you know, he has a, a chapter on relationships and, and so like the central thing that he says there is that, that he says, you know, since he's all about ego transcendence and being present in the now and surrendered, he says the ego cannot love because it always wants something, right? And so, so as long as we, on that level, go into a relationship with, with wanting and desire and attachment and hatred, uh, you know that that is that is really a great practice for ego transcendence. And, and another point, he says, three uh, three failed relationships in as many years will bring you closer to enlightenment or awakening than being shut off in a room on on a in a desert island. Yeah. And, and I also like this quote from Adya Shanti, who said, "The depth and embodiment of your spiritual realization will be seen in your love relationships." That's where the proof is in the pudding. If it all falls apart in your love relationships, then you have some work to do, and people have a lot of problems in their relationships. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, Adya Shanti is married. He's a Buddhist uh, American teacher, and who does you know um, Zen style retreats and has quite a following. And he's married, and then one day he had this idea that they could do sort of like a relationship retreat together with his wife, and it apparently turned out in quite a disaster because he realized that, you know, people can be quite enlightened and send like when they're by themselves in, in a retreat and sit on their meditation cushion, uh, but translating, you know, their semi-enlightened state into their relationships, a lot of people struggled and he realized that, that these people need more couples counseling and psychotherapy than actually, uh, you know, Zen type spiritual practice. Hmm. And maybe one last comment is, is um, the Pactro process, you know, relationships are so important because it's really where the unmanifest, right, is this, this sense of connectedness with everything with the ground of all being, you know, we get in touch in relationships with the manifest world. And there's just nothing as intense uh, as, as a love relationship where we share a home and our sexuality and money and, you know, power struggles and emotions. I mean, we all know how, you know, how challenging relationships can be and often the more evolved we are and the more enlightened we are, you know, the, the higher our expectations are and, and the more the challenges. Mm. But you could maybe also say that some people don't uh, really recognize this unconditional um, dimension or uh, so, so for them, maybe it's also a step on the way to to experience that. Um, and what what I noticed, I've been to all the workshops here in Denmark with Martin, and and he, he does a very powerful exercise in this workshop where where people get to experience this unconditional um, unconditional love because. May, People are strangers to each other when we arrive in this, uh, these workshops, and and wh what I noticed all the times is that people get a really strong, unconditional connection to each other, and and that can be a huge shift for many people. Um, but you're also gonna do uh, work more on this unconditional aspect on the one-year training. Can you maybe say a little bit about that? Yes, this is. Uh when we come together for the first time at the end of October, we will spend quite a bit of time to uh, develop probably for each individual person uh, a one-year spiritual practice based on where they are in the moment, you know, on, on their spiritual path and, and how deeply they are already steeped in uh, being able to access the gross, the subtle, the causal, the witness stage, and then eventually the non-dual stage. Uh, so that at the end of the year, hopefully, everybody is somewhat at, at, at the same level, and, and that will be an ongoing practice throughout the training, and then also when, when you know, a daily practice for, for all the participants. Because I, I hope that by now it is fairly clear that 
that if we're not grounded in this in this un, uh, realm of uh, unconditional love or of the ground of all being, then you know when when relationship challenges come up, we're already so charged that you know even though we will what is the, the the second part of the essentials is to basically have this huge toolbox available we all know when we get into contraction and we, when we get into fear and you know then then we get agitated and it's very hard to to stay present with that and then use the tools that that we have available I mean most couples have experienced that, that they could never imagine that they would yell at each other or run out of the room or you know go into these fight flight freeze uh, reactions uh, and then when they're in there all of a sudden all the tools that they acquired are all of a sudden not accessible to them so it is really important that we can stay that we learn to stay present with that and there's of course certain techniques how we can do that with our partner that we that we will practice and then use the tools that are available to us otherwise having the tools available when we need them and can't access them, the tools become useless. Mm. So that yeah. will be an ongoing practice throughout uh, when you're training. Mm. And I think we lost the... Uh, yeah, we, we have Stain. lost the Panilla and Stin in the way they have some trouble with their mics and computers, but... Yeah. If they show up, so maybe yeah, yeah. Then we can ask them how they experience that in the workshop. Yeah, sure. Um, Do you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. So basically, this was the first two. Uh, the the, the first one. The first. Yeah. Yeah. The the first one was that lo uh, love, uh, unconditional love, and the, the next yeah. one I mentioned just briefly, but we're gonna go more in in depth with that one and. The second one is that love is unconditional and relationships are not, so we touched upon it, but you can maybe say a few more words about that one. Yes. That uh, will be probably the biggest part in the training and it's basically reflected what, what's in the book. So uh, sometimes people are confused. Uh, I'm not sure if I should say this on the call, but my daughter is sort of like struggling with that a little bit. That, that she's really deeply in love with, with a man, and, and in a way they get along great, but uh, their lifestyles are so different, and they're in such different places in in their life. And I, I keep telling her, she's just just confused between the love part, which is definitely there, and the relational part. And I think a lot of people are confused between the two. You know how how they can be really feel a deep, authentic, unconditional, quote-unquote, love uh, to a person, but struggle in the relationship. And um, I think if, if we learn how to separate the two and realize that, that we can unconditionally love someone, uh, but also accept that because we have different life circumstances, we are in different stages of development and so on and so forth, uh, really co-creating a relationship is, is very difficult. And to summarize for those who, who are not familiar with, with the integral model, uh, what, what integral basically means is that, that we make distinctions between, you know, between different aspects of our humanness and then we reintegrate once we have made these distinctions, these dimensions. And, and the way we approach that in the integral relationship model is, first of all, you know, there's there's often this there's this famous book, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, where, where we very often stereotype into males and females, and then try to find why you know we can't have healthier relationships with each other. So in integral, we already start to distinguish and say, well, there is male and female physical bodies you know, with the sex organs and different hormones and maybe different brain structures and, and everything that has to do with our different physicality. We then distinguish between learned gender roles. Obviously, males and females, boys and girls, are differently raised in, in, and there are, there are cultural differences that have nothing to do with biology. Then we further dis distinguish between feminine and masculine polarities. So again, very often a lot of people equate 
having a female body with being feminine and having a male body with being masculine in integral uh, theory or in, in integral relationship practice we realize that males and females can equally embody feminine and masculine polarities and there is two of each and there is healthy and unhealthy aspects to them and then a, a fourth distinction we make is what, what's called the anima animus complex that's a Jungian concept where the animus complex are uh, male aspects that, that, that a female represses into her unconscious and then projects on males and the anima complex is the opposite are female aspects that males repress and then project on women so we're already making four distinctions instead of just saying male female uh, then we make distinctions that, that we all have different capacities and different interests, different passions you know, that, that can range from being musical or mathematical or be more into gardening uh, and just these different, uh, some people are more relational and so, so we all have these different capacities which in integral we call developmental lines. Um, the next distinction we're going to make is that, that people develop in, in consciousness, we call that, uh, in, in seven or eight different stages uh, which sometimes is related to the evolution of humanity from very early human archaic stages to you know the stages when, when people broke free and went on heroic journeys to mythic stages where life was very much uh, built around religious beliefs to, to the modern and postmodern and integral and higher stages or in child development there are, there are these levels of development so we can go into the details there but, but people are at different levels of development and as a very rough statement uh, I say it's, it's really difficult to be with somebody in a, uh, in a relationship with someone who is at a different uh, level of consciousness development then we're also going to look at stages of spiritual development there's five different stages or state stages in sexual development so, so it, it, that uh, the model becomes sort of like three dimensional that we're not only looking at flat puzzle pieces that are laying around which very often relationship teachings are and they're very, they're very uh, valid because you know you, you need to be aware of all these puzzle pieces but there is also vertical development where, where things become more three-dimensional so to speak mm. then uh, we look at states of consciousness so these are temporary phases that we go through for example when we fall in love we're obviously our perception of the world as we all experience changes when we fall in love and then when problems in the relationship arise then, then we often go in, into a different state but states can also be drug induced or they can be peak experiences or dream states and things like that and last but not least uh, we're going to look at, at types, personality types like being an introvert, being an extrovert uh, the five love languages of people have these preferences how they give and receive love either through touch or through words or through acts of service or spending quality time or gifts uh, or the Enneagram which is you know probably could do a whole year just the training on, on the Enneagram and, and how that affects relationships so we're going to look at, at personality types so these are the, the five basic elements and the bottom line of that is that, that A if we're aware of all these elements and we have them you know as a metaphor in our toolbox then when relationship conflicts arise or if you want to grow in the relationship and learn and heal then we have access to these tools and so the, the shorthand for that is that love is unconditional but relationships are not and we're really looking at the conditional aspects of relationships which will in essence allow couples who are in a relationship that is going fairly well to realize their healing and growth potentials in the relationships and for couples who have really a lot of difficulties in the relationship really sit together in a loving and compassionate way and instead of blaming each other realizing that they're just in at we call it the cosmic address you know they're just in a different stage in that, in that whole uh, 
integral map that I just outlined and and would probably be better off like like my ex-wife and I were we, we didn't fight we just realized we were just in di very different places in our life and had different needs in the relationship and if if people are single of course it helps them to look beyond just falling madly in love with someone which of course is great because this is where all the healing and growth potential is but also really look is that a partner who is good for me and am I even more importantly good for for this person in really co-creating the kind of relationship that we both want. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, now uh, Panilla and Steen is back uh, online again, and uh, we've we've just been going over the first two just to sum up. Also, there's also new viewers online now, but the, we we've been going over the two first uh, essentials, which is love is unconditional and the second one is love is unconditional but relationships are not just to anybody who is new and to Penilla and Steen that's what we've been talking about uh, so far and we also have a question popping in right now or, or not just a, f a few moments ago about um, the, the, the two first ones so I'm just gonna read that um, so this is from Adelheid. This is a woman from somewhere. Uh, she, she is writing, I don't think that we need to follow the concept of unconditional love in relationships. When you don't have a partner with whom you are safe, the unconditional love puts you into situations which women in the past centuries have had all the time, that we allow the others to abuse us and we called it love perhaps. I don't think you are talking about that, do you, Martin? So I, this is a question. Yeah. Hi, Thank Arthur. Hi. Uh, uh, we know each other. I, I think this is what I try to, to say with love is unconditional in relationships or not. So I know this is quite a stretch of the imagination, but we can feel compassion even for very, you know, evil people in a way but we would never want to be in relationship with them. So that's exactly this point of if we connect with everything that arises and there is, that includes, you know, probably the most horrible people on the planet or the most horrible events on the planet that we can imagine, but it doesn't mean that we, that we are passive around that, but that we change our, in, in the physical, in the manifest world, our relationship to in that case, a, a person, an abusive person, by having clear boundaries. Otherwise, we just become a doormat. So yes, exactly as you said, I don't mean uh, that last night I saw something on TV here about uh, uh, domestic violence, right? And, uh, and, and this is exactly this case, you know, where, where what they reported that some people are so pathologically attached to another person, even if that person is a physical abuser, you know, they, they cannot uh, separate and, 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 and draw clear boundaries. So this is the clear distinction between love is un uh, uh, unconditional, but relationships are not. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to say it one more time that it's possible to submit questions. You can do it here on Google+, Plus, or you can also send an email to mail at heartaction.dk if you didn't catch it before. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but now that we have Panilla and uh, Stein back online, maybe you, you missed a little bit of what was going on here, but <laughs> but maybe you have some reflections on these two themes of unconditional love and and the, uh, the other that unconditional love is a fact but relationships are not unconditional and since you're a couple <laughs> how, how do you experience that in real life <laughs> <Whoa. Whoa. laughs> unfortunately we missed a lot of, of, of your points here the, the last the seven minutes Martin we, we just fought with our with the technique and uh, so actually I think that you should move on and maybe we can you know join you in a 
Well, maybe you can reflect a little bit how when we did a workshop, you remember we started with, with the circle with the unconditional love part. Yeah. And meditation, and I think throughout the workshop we had exercises, you know, woven in that, that would allow people to connect on this unconditional level. But then we also had exercises where we clearly showed, you know, that, that even though we may love a person unconditionally, that doesn't mean we have to be in relationship with them or can be in a healthy relationship with them. But Adelheid, the question just, mm. you know, referred to, that, mm. that, that does not mean that we stay in an abusive or, you mm. know, non-functional relationship. Mm. And that there are reasons why sometimes relationships cannot be, you know, made healthy. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. the only healthy response is to leave that relationship, but based on solid information and not just on you know, assumptions mm. and projections. But that's actually one of the greatest things about your workshop uh, and the training too, as I guess, <laughs> um, that uh, you you can explain and you can read about this, but but uh, the way that you put it into exercises and simple tools and uh, makes us experience what you actually mean, and we we feel the difference. We feel the difference when you, you show us the different situations. And um, so I think that, that, that it's through that kind of these kind of exercises that we get more and more aware of the distinction that you just make now. Um, and that's one of the greatest... Uh, uh, in fact, one of the greatest arguments for, for joining the workshop and joining the course uh, because it's it's uh, you feel it in your own body and you feel it in, in your own heart, and uh, that that gives what you uh, explain now sense. It makes sense when you have experienced it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. How was that for you, Stein? Well, very much alike, but um, for me, it's very important that that the um, that, that I can feel it in my body, the the uh, all the things, all the all the exercises that you that you taught us and that that you that you showed us, um, and and for me it's very important that what we what you are teaching is also what I can feel in my body, and you're very mm -hmm. very good at, at uh, doing that and and educate in 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 that kind of 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 a, of a way so. For me, it was um, it was a mind and body cause, a mind and body wake up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of um, you you sort of create an awareness that we actually know what you're teaching us, but we didn't know that. I mean, we we didn't knew that we know it, but you were sort of waking it, and then we get more. Uh, aware of what's going on, and that's a great way to uh, to practice spirituality. I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, one more, one more question popped in. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can just take the last question before we go. We will continue to the to the next um, point. So this question is Martin. How much, in your experience, do you think people's self-appraisals of cosmic addresses are accurate, <laughs> given our human tendency and capacity for inflation? This is uh, Patrick mm -hmm. that asks this question. So, well. Um I think there is clearly differences, uh, you know, how realistic people are, and again, relationships are so helpful because if we constantly get mirrored back, you know, what, uh, how we behave, you know, how our words basically are aligned with our actions, uh, that that is a very good indicator to be more realistic. Uh, I don't want to become too technical for the people who are not familiar with with the stage conception, but for those who who uh, are. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned these eight vertical stages, and very often people self-assess two stages higher than they are actually are, and that has to do with that we can rationally, cognitively, 
let's say somebody reads Ken Wilber's books or any integral book, uh, understand the, the concepts in, in, in our mind. Um, but but for, for, for those who are not really familiar mm -hmm. with the cosmic address, maybe you can just uh, give a brief introduction to that so, oh. so everybody is with us. Well, yeah. <laughs> that is uh, that is of course uh, that's a simple. But but the uh, the cosmic address is basically the, the summary of these different dimensions that I just mentioned earlier. You know, what physical body are we in? What is our cultural conditioning? Right? How do we see the world from a cultural perspective? Are we more in a feminine or a masculine energy? Uh, what is our state of consciousness, right? Are we more sleepy right now or more awake? Or are we on a, on a high or on a low? Are we depressed? Are we excited, right? That would be the, the state that we're in. Uh, then, you know, what, what are our overall values that, that, that we, or worldviews, right? Are we a conservative? Are we liberal? You know, uh, what, are, what is our belief system? And, and what personality type are we? Are you an introvert, an extrovert? What Enneagram type are you? So, so the combination of, of everything that, that makes you human, that, that unless we have this map and really, as Stain and Pernilla said, you know, have, have explored it, not just in our head, but, but really lived it first in a workshop environment, in a training environment, and then in, in a lived reality, then you know it's very hard to kind of like become so aware of where you are, you know, what your cosmic address is and what your partner's cosmic address is. Mm. So, when well, I guess what that, the that question would be also the cosmic is, address. Yeah. And and then to come back to that question to 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 uh, assess, you know, where you are in the moment. Uh, that's a little bit like wandering around in, in, in a forest, you know, if you have a map and you can look at the map and see where you are and then maybe two or three other people look at, you know, at the map and say, yes, this is really, I think, where you are. So you're not only judging yourself, but you get feedback from others, specifically in an intimate relationship, but maybe also in, in a group, then that will allow you to, you know, assess your cosmic address much more accurately than if you just do it without a map and without feedback from others. And maybe the feedback uh -huh. from others is an essential part because I just read something today about people getting asked questions in these polls. They usually have a tendency to uh, to to talk about themselves as being more healthy and and mm -hmm. taking the right choices, but the reality usually shows. Uh, that that they actually not as developed as they would like uh, to sure, show yeah. off to the world. So so maybe the feedback is a really important aspect of. Oh, that that's yeah. That's the only way to really do that. Uh, uh, Pacific Intercall for those who are interested, that they really have great assessment tools. Uh, so you can I think it's PacificIntercall.org, uh, and and if you want to you know assess where where you are in your development, they they offer tools. And that will be also a great aspect of being together for one year, including me, you know, that I get assessed by other people in, in this training and we assess each other and give each other feedback. I mean, this is for me the most exciting part of this whole training to, to really, after a while, see where everybody's cosmic address is and, and where we have healing and, and growth potentials together and do it over the course of a year and not only in a weekend workshop. Mm. Maybe it could be interesting to hear from Stein and Panela uh, about this cosmic address. You, you've been uh, taught all these levels and uh, stages and stuff on the workshop. How have was it difficult for you to see where you were in these stages, and or was it something that was quite obvious? So how have you dealt with it? Um. Well, I, I, I look upon it as um, I think that I am in many different places all the time. So uh, I don't consider myself as a person in one specific address. I think that, 
that uh, have um, different <laughs> addresses, actually. Oh yeah, yeah. And and that that um, that I'm all the time working on getting on a higher level. But sometimes I'm working on a few addresses in this corner, and sometimes I'm working in another field. Uh, does it make sense? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so because I think that if you just think that you're one place, you you get lazy or you get blind or you get, uh, you know, just um, stuck. You forget what it's all about. It's about about awareness, being mm. aware, being uh, critical and gentle at the same time. Like you're, you know, that you have to grow um, every day. But sometimes it's the field where you have your children, the connection with me and my son, for instance, and and their work in in some aspects, and and at other times it's uh, how I relate to my customers. Hmm. I mean, and it's all part of my relation, and then in that way I um, when I grow in all the different addresses. I, I raise my cap, 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 what does it, capacity. capacity to grow as um, uh, a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very important point that you're making. That that of course the cosmic address is not static. You know we're <laughs> we're moving all the time, and some people are they have less of a range, so they're more stuck in in a certain area, and mm -hmm. some other people they're they're just you know very fluid, yeah. and some people are very fluid in, in in maybe not such a healthy way, and other people are very fluid in a very healthy way by adapting to whatever is in front of them. You know, mm -hmm. as you just said, you know, you interact differently with Stain than with your children, than with a customer, than mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. yes, having that fluidity and know what's healthy and unhealthy is very crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that we should go to the the third and the last point now, which yes. is uh, sharing an authentic purpose. That that's something you put a uh, huge emphasis on. The, the the relationships of the future have this shared purpose. It's not just for the individuals, but it's also reaching beyond that. So right. So, so that is something that that emerged for me a few weeks actually after I uh, finished writing the book or a few months. And you may have noticed so far we primarily talked so like about looking at each other. Right? We we very often think of relationships. You know, can I get along with this person? Am I in love with this person? Uh, what what can we co-create together in in the relationship? You know, help each other to evolve, to heal, to grow, uh, maybe even to spiritually awaken. But but there is still, in, in most of the time when we talk about relationships, there is a, a main focus on on what we can do for each other, or what our partner can do for us, and what we can do for our partner. And 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 what I realized is that. Um, you know, true. That's so like a, a teaching that emerged in the last few years is this idea of have, that we have an authentic purpose. So once we realize that there is evolution and that there is directionality in evolution, uh, which Barbara Marx Hubbard or Steve McIntosh in Evolution's Purpose, um, and it, it's so like around Andrew Cohen, the, the, the community that, that fell apart since then. But but they they have this idea of being evolutionaries, uh, to really bring something into the world that that has not existed before or make a unique contribution. And and I realized uh, for myself, and and I think that resonates with with other people like Adelheid who contributed earlier. She I know she works together with her partner. We see more and more couples in the world who, who not only look at each other, but they look at what is the unique contribution that we can make to the world uh, if we both share a similar or, or even the same evolutionary purpose. 
So that's not in my current book. That's in the new book that I'm that I'm writing. But there is already enough teaching out there. But these these teachings out there are usually focused on the individual. And and my idea for and the, the future of relationships is really that we uh, that we co-create. And I have this image that uh, I don't know if you can paste that in somewhere of of four circles that that say. Uh, that's sort of like a purpose is what we love to do, what we are good at, what the world needs, and what the world pays for, right? And so, so if we feel aligned with this, what we're good at, what we love to do, what the world needs, right? So that the world doesn't need more of pollution and doesn't need more of wars and doesn't need. There's certain things that the world doesn't need more of, but there are other things that the world needs more of, right? So we want to focus on something that, that, that serves the world. Because sometimes, obviously, the people who flew the planes into the 9-11, which is tomorrow, in, into the World Trade Center in New York, they felt that this was their authentic evolutionary purpose. Maybe they didn't call it that way, but they felt deeply called to doing that. But they missed the part that, that more violence and killing people is not something that the world needs. Mm -hmm. right, so this needs to be balanced by some moral and ethical uh, um, uh, criteria. And so if you find a partner who shares a similar or the same evolutionary purpose, which could be you know, to rescue animals or to teach something together or to uh, invent a product or a solution to a problem, I think this, because we haven't had that really in, in, the, in recent history of, of uh, humanity, in the last few thousand years, where, where males were mainly had, had the most power in the public sphere and, and females had most of the power in the domestic sphere. And now, of course, you know, females have entered the domestic, uh, the public sphere, and, and males have some, depending on in what country you are, in Scandinavian countries more than in America, you know, entered the domestic sphere. But, but this co creation in the domestic and in the public sphere from an evolutionary purpose, again, which we can really authentically only get in touch with if we're connecting to, to point one of, of the three essentials, you know, that, that you deeply are connected with Eros, the evolutionary impulse that brought us here and that created everything around us. And we're, we're deeply in this, in this flow and what our role in that is. And we find a partner who shares that passion, that purpose, and we then start to co-create as, as equals and opposites, you know, with different perspectives. I think Jürgen Habermas said, we can never have the whole horizon in, in our view. We only see basically 180 degrees, right, what's in front of us. We don't see what's behind us. And so maybe that's a simple metaphor where, where co-creation makes so much sense, where we may have opposite views and opposite perspectives, but we're equals, you know, from the level we're looking at reality and where we feel this is our purpose in the world. And so, I, I mean, I, I feel really deeply, deeply excited about that because I, I briefly experienced that in a relationship and it turned out that my former partner didn't really share my purpose, but, but when we were co-creating, that was just like so utterly exciting. It, it, it really dwarfed anything else that I had ever experienced in a relationship, you know, to, to be in this evolutionary flow together and to co-create. And, and, and I think that's really the future of not only relationships, but really the future of humanity, that we co-create in this evolutionary flow together. And so that, that will be part of the, of the training that, that we're going to start at the end of October. Mm. And which you probably can tell, which I'm most excited about, because <laughs> it, it, you know all the other things they now feel like preliminaries, right? We have to go through these first two steps, and we will, right? Practicing that we really can love, not only love unconditionally, but but then as a next step, really connect deeply with this evolutionary impulse and evolutionary flow, then learn, get all the tools that we need to make a relationship work, and then the third step, really co-creating 
uh, out into the world, you know, as, as this utilitarian statement to serve the greatest good for the largest number of people, together as a couple with equal rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, that that's really ultimately what I want to dedicate the rest of my life uh, to, you know, to please, please do. to bring this mission into the world. And so I'm grateful for everybody who's on this call and who's watching that, and, and to you, uh, Pernille and Stein and Johannes and everybody at ID Academy who, who offers all of us this opportunity. I think really for the first time in in in, in human history, <laughs> I, I even go that far to to bring a group of people from all over Europe at least together to to explore this over the course for one year and 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 and. and, and realize it in, in their day-to-day -day life and then have it spread out in, into the world. That's the only way that this can happen. You know, not just by me having a vision, but really others coming together and sharing it, practicing it, refining it, living it, and then after a year I think we will have a real solid uh, first emergence of that in, in the world. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, and I just wanted to bring in uh, Steen and Penilla maybe w one more time because we just talked about this issue about sharing and authentic purpose and how has it affected you hearing Martin probably also in the workshop talk about this idea of sharing and authentic purpose or was it something you already did or was it, how, uh, how do you relate to that? Um. Yeah, we we already felt that we uh, share this uh, purpose, but when Martin uh, spoke about it in the workshop, it just became more more clear that that this field of working with your spirituality through this relationship is uh, is um, is. Uh, maybe the, the 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 best way to grow. Uh, because uh, it's not about sitting uh, in your own living room with a pillow and you just sit there and you just sit there and meditate, but actually when you when you have to do something, when you feel the calling and you are cobbled to that you share it, it's much more um, you have to live it. You have to live it in your everyday life, in in the way you are you you. Um, Mm. You spend your money in the way mm -hmm. that you raise your children, in the way that you um, addresses your neighbors, in the way that you prioritize if you're going on holiday or if you're saving money because you want to do something else together because you want to grow. So, so it's it's uh, a very profound way to um, to make spirituality uh, um, al make it come alive, not only as an idea. Something that you, oh, I have to meditate, or I have to do like this and this, but it's a part of your everyday life, and and when it's um, it's something that is between us, it's both um, something we share, but it's also a direction, something that we have to um, what is it, the um, way. Mm. Put a lot of attention to. Uh, yes, and, yeah. and you yeah. have to um, put it, uh, put attention to it all the time. You have to be aware all the time. Is this the right thing to do in order to obtain this and that? Uh, so it cr creates a certain kind of awareness that uh, is unique, I think. Mm. So for you, it's not just uh, like this idea that you can write down this, uh, this to have a shared purpose. It's something more. It seems like it's not just something very fixed. Or no, <laughs> it's it's more like a lifestyle. It's, mm. it's the way that we are living. We are trying to living our lives. And Martin, you you talked earlier about what can I do for my partner and what can she do for me. Um. It's not like that. It's what what can I do for for us, and and how mm -hmm. and how can what can I do so so we can live better, and so we can live the way that we want to do. Mm -hmm. That's what what I uh, really 
uh, learned in the workshop in, in, uh, in Silkeborg earlier this year, that's the we space. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not ego clashing, it, it's not, it's not, um, it's not just me, not just what, what can I do, it's just what can we do together. And mm -hmm. when we are doing things to be, together, we are uh, bonding much more, and the love is growing much more than we are doing things yeah. together. Mm. Yes, we. As some people say, from me to we, that mm. is that that first step. You know, where, where it becomes a we, or somebody mm. in, in Hamburg recently said, you know, it's instead of focusing on the other, you focus on the relationship. Yeah. But then, when you go from me to we, the next step is to to, to us. Mm. Right? From yeah, me to yeah. we to us, which means your community, your family, yeah, 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 yeah. and then to all of us, which means all humanity. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, yeah, yeah. and these four dimensions are all connected. Of course, there is a a me and a you in the relationship, but there is also a we, the we space, right? And then there is a us, where 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 the two of you are connected with with others, yeah. and then there is all of us. Yeah, and that's really the. Um, now I don't know the English word. You know, the span we want to cover in in the training is really to go from from me, you know, the unconditional love part to we, you know, this creating a relationship to us and serving a, a purpose that ultimately serves the world and and all humanity and all creation yeah. and future generations. You know, mm -hmm. to 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 step out of this relatively self-centered, you know. It's great to be in the now, and that's the basis for the future. But but we need to move on to the next step, you know, in a way based, grounded in the now, mm -hmm. and in presence and surrender to think about how do my actions in the now impact future generations, or or even you know five or ten years from now. Just yesterday, I heard that the global warming or or, or CO two uh, in 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 the atmosphere is actually growing faster than they, that they had expected. You know, we, I live in Los Angeles now. It's just like crazy. You know, I, I live in Northern California, which is relatively, environment, relatively environmentally conscious. And just to move here and to see how mindlessly people are, you know, polluting the city is just like crazy, you know. Mm. So that they, I, I often feel they don't think very much what, what their actions now and their desires now how that will impact future generations. And that's what what I want to share and learn and develop together in, in, in our group. You know, how, how can we be more responsible together uh, in, in our relationships as, as the basis for a peaceful and sustainable future for, for all living beings and for humanity. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that the the time is coming to an end, but we, we, ha we have one more question also that I think should be answered, uh, which comes from Bettina from Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asks, I think I understand what kind of exercises could induce unconditional love, such as meditating, looking into each other's eyes, inquiry, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. But what kind of exercises helps you through the unconditional uh, challenges in a relationship, uh, quote unquote, uh, unconditional? Yeah. Well. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, she's right. That's what we you you are doing in the workshop. This is exercises like this to induce the unconditional state. But what kind of exercises would help the more conditional? States. Yeah. So that's that's exactly the right way to put it. You know, I think she has a good grasp on what are the practices to to love unconditionally, and to deal with the conditional parts of relationships effectively. It requires actually the the first one that that when an emotion, a feeling, a challenge comes up, that we do not get taken over by that and just react like a knee jerk reaction. But we can say, oh, okay, pause. This 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 conflict, that challenge is coming up, right? But now, if mm -hmm. you don't have any tools available available to deal with that, then you know you just notice there is a conflict, but you don't know how to 
communicate or what the techniques are or why that conflict is emerging. So, uh, so th this is the answer to that is that you need that grounding not to get lost in the challenge and then you need the tools you know, that, that we will teach and develop and, and, and explore in the training to, to address the conflict. And it's also, you know, I sometimes are a little bit reluctant to say that, but sometimes we also really realize that, that we're just in different spaces in, in our life or, in, you know, that are, that cannot be bridged, you know, and sometimes it is then better to, in a very loving, compassionate and understanding way, you know, end the relationship. So, so I'm not one of these people who says, oh yeah, just read my book and use all these tools and then when you fall in love, you will have a great relationship. You know, it, it sometimes um, the relationship becomes great because we realize we're not meant to be to be a lifelong couple, but but we we were meant to be together to learn what we had to learn from this relationship and then to move on. So I want to be very clear about this. This is not sort of like the five secrets to have like a, an amazing relationship. It's the five secrets, you know, how how you can potentially create this this. Uh, relationship that sometimes it requires, as Adelheid also in a way pointed to, to, to end, end the relationship. So I hope that somewhat has answered that question that, that we need to be grounded in both. And maybe I, I, I want to close on my part with this uh, statement. It's really deeply grounded in Immanuel Kant's uh, philosophy of uh, theory without experience is blind, right, and that's what Stain and Pernille talked about, you know, that, that just having the theory, if you don't experience it, it's, it's blind, it's useless. But uh, experience without theory is, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> experience without theory is, uh, theory without experience is mere intellectual play. In other words, we can talk about this forever if we don't experience it. But experience without theory is blind which means if we stumble around in our relationships without having the tools, the, the theoretical background available, then you know, we're, we're basically we're, we're like blind uh, people stumbling around in the dark. So mm -hmm. I should have read it uh, off my book, but <laughs> <laughs> you get the idea, right? So we need, we need both the experience you know, and the theory in order to make sense of our human experience. One without the other uh, is not really good enough to, to address the challenges that, that we're all facing in, in our modern and postmodern lives. Mm. And I guess that's also what's really, uh, what I really enjoyed about your workshop, that it's, it, it is actually both theoretical and also practical and experiential. So. Maybe uh, we should just use the last uh, few minutes to just talk a little bit about this training and that's coming up. And Martin, um, is there anything you need to add to this? Um? Yeah, maybe Pernille and Stin can, because so we're basically the team who are uh, putting together uh, this training and organize it together with ID Academy which is one of the largest schools in Scandinavia for psychotherapists and mindfulness and coaches. Uh, and this will also be, now I'm doing all the talking, this will be also be a certification training. So you have multiple options. You can just participate in, in the one-year training. With uh, We come together four times for five days from Wednesday to Sunday in, in True Home near Copenhagen. And then we will meet every two weeks uh, online through video and there will be, of course, assignments to, you know, throughout the year. And then at the end of the training, um, you can get certified as an integral relationship practitioner, which uh, you know, will be through ID Academy. So you, you can use that as, a, as credentials for your um, coaching or uh, couples counseling or whatever you do at practice. And then we will have one more modules for people who did the, the four first modules, which will be for people who want to facilitate these workshops that we have talked about. So that that's an additional module that, that you may or may not want to do. 
Mm. And the, uh, the information about the, the training is at idacademy.org, on, on, on idacademy.org website. And just coming up, there's one extra question coming in about the training, so I thought that would be relevant mm. to just bring that in, and that's a practical question. Um, can you give an estimate about how much time a day I will need to practice and readings and stuff like mm. that? It's from Sandra. Yeah. So I, how much does it require? I mean, this training? It depends, of course, a little bit on how much somebody already knows. Uh, so we will have about three books required reading, uh, be, you know, between the modules. So it will be about 12 books to read. And again, depends a little bit how fast somebody is reading. Uh, or maybe have already read the books. Uh, so maybe that takes an hour a day, I don't know. And then some people may already have a spiritual practice, or it will be not only a spiritual, but more of a what's called the integral life practice, you know, body, mind, heart, and soul development, because they all work together. So, you know, that's probably an hour, hour a day, but most people, or some people, may already have elements like that. So I would say about one to two hours a day. Uh, but if you already read books, if you already exercise, and if you already meditate, then you can weave that into your day-to-day -day life. And then the support calls, they will be every other week for probably an hour or two. And then there will also be individual coaching, so if people get stuck in some areas or need some some more support, then, then there will be one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions as, as needed with, with me and, and, and the training. Or possibly also with Wistain and uh, Pernille and you, you know, if it's a local thing. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess. Did you want to add something, Pernille and Stein? Uh, not really. Uh, I think you <laughs> pointed it out very well, Martin. We're just looking forward to, to the uh, dance to begin. Yeah. Hmm. I always feel a little self-conscious because uh, I did a lot of talking. I know that and come across as somewhat of a smart ass here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when people do the workshop, they, they really realize, as you already said, that, that this is very experiential. And I yeah. I strive hard not to only talk about this stuff, but, but to also transmit it in a way and, of course, live it in, in, in my own day-to-day uh, mm -hmm. -day life. So, so this will be not you know, me talking all the time. Uh, there will probably be very little, in a way, talking and framing, but really a lot of uh, group work, you know, where, where you talk with your participants and, and, and where we really deepen and develop that together and, and not me just talking at you. And there will be many more exercises, of course, than we have in, in, in the weekend workshop. It's all about embodiment, right? This this kind of word of of not only cognitively understanding it, but but really embodying it. I mean, I could teach you all that stuff in a weekend and or in, in three or four days and and do some exercises. But but this is what we call leads to a state experience. You would all be excited and fired up, and yeah, we got it. And then two weeks later, you know, you you pretty much fall back in your normal modus operandi, and and we just know. I mean, we didn't invent that. We just know that it takes at least a year uh, and then an ongoing practice to to really lift that for the rest of your life and, and develop it further. Mm. And the same goes for me. You know, that, that I will be just one of the people who is practicing with you. Mm. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I guess that's uh, the end of this... Uh live stream the three essentials of uh, integral relationships um, yeah and but we will have one more uh, live stream on the 24th um, could you introduce that Martin just uh, the, the the next yeah. call yeah uh, that will be with uh, Ole what's his I always forget his name last name Ole Adam Dale yeah, yeah. Uh, who's of course, a magnificent uh, writer and teacher, and and uh, you know, uh, founder of ID Academy in his own right. So he will probably do a lot of the talking, and we haven't fully decided at what what we want to address. But 
but I suggested to him that, that we really go through these four stages of uh, from me to we to us to all of us and, and, and really zone in from an integral and relational perspective on, on, on what do these four dimensions really mean in our you know, in our relational life. Mm. Yeah, so you can find more information about the next uh, call on idacademy.org where you can also find more information about the one-year training so and if you want to go deeper into Martin's work he also has a home page integral relationships no, no it's integral relationship right without an s yeah. Dot, yeah. dot com yeah. so you can also check out more about Martin mm -hmm. and um, yeah then I guess uh, that's it for now we went 15 minutes over, but people are still hanging on, so it seems yeah. like it was interesting enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you, Johannes and Pranilla and Stein for yeah. making this happening. Thank you. And yeah. for co-facilitating and supporting the whole the whole training. And yeah. I'm going to swing on my bicycle now and uh, brave the Los Angeles roads and <laughs> go to my office in West Hollywood. It's it's noon here, so uh, yeah. I still have a day ahead of me, and yeah. you guys oh, can no. relax into the evening. Yeah, I think we we're gonna go to bed probably. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's been wonderful uh, to hang out with with you and uh, to share this with the viewers and um, of course questions can also come in later and maybe some of the questions could be addressed in the next uh, call if, mm -hmm. if uh, there's anything missing for somebody yeah. out there. So I guess I want to say thank you to everybody and and uh, enjoy. Good night. Yeah, good, good night, night and uh, enjoy good night. your day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have, have a great day, Marzen, and sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Hannes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.